trade and jobs um, program that, that covers the whole Central Asia region. And for the past 20 years, he worked on donor funded projects, including a lot of WTO related accession and, and business environment improvement, trade facilitation um, and institutional capacity building. Um, welcome, uh, Jovan. And I let me see if, if Nelaku Geboy Desta is also there. Um, well, he will join in a bit, I suppose. Um, but Melaku Desta is, um, is our expert uh, based in Addis in Ethiopia, and he's a principal regional advisor in, the, uh, in UNECA on uh, regional integration and trade. And uh, Melaku has an interesting background that also encompasses the academic sector where he's been uh, working. Um, as a professor of international economic law and head of the PhD program in Leicester, uh, in the UK and also in Scotland. He has worked with them um, uh, on ACFTA negotiations and also served um, uh, the APRM secretariat in Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome, Melako, I hope you are joining us. Um, yeah, so um, we have um, quite some, some time to, uh, to, um, to discuss with the experts, but also we hope to get inputs from the audience uh, on, on WTO accession uh, technical assistance. So at the moment, there are around 23 countries in accession talks. Already 36 other countries have gone through the accession process. Um, complex, sometimes painstaking, um, process of adjusting domestic frameworks and at the same time negotiating market access. Um, this means we also have around, well, 50 perhaps technical assistance, uh, different technical assistance uh, programs, even more. Sometimes donors are even complementing each other in, in providing accession related technical assistance. And with this session, we would like to see, um, to learn from uh, uh, what has worked, um, perhaps also from what has not worked, because we can be frank in technical uh, assistance. Um, uh, and um, we will really look also at how development partners can support meaningful W2 accession in the different phases. So before, during and after accession. Um, right. Please, if you as participant would like to engage with us and ask a question, don't hesitate to use the Q&A on, on the bottom. And um, by the end of our session, we will pick um, uh, interesting uh, questions where possible. Uh, so perhaps um, let's first start with a, with a general question. What can development partners bring to, to W2 accession um, to support exceeding governments and perhaps beyond the government? Uh, Jovan, would you like to give it a shot? It's, it's, it seems that you don't have much of a choice. I'm the only one kind of visible in this <laughs> conference at the moment. Uh, well, yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for, for having me on this conference. Thank you to the WTO Secretariat who organized everything. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to share experiences uh, and basically provide information to people who are involved in uh, uh, W2 accessions. So I, I guess that's a great thing to be here and uh, uh, add some of my experience in, uh, into the whole uh, story. Uh, I just want to make clear at the beginning that uh, Actually, my experience is not the experience of a donor organization itself. Uh, I'm actually, uh, for the last 20 years, working in the field, implementing uh, programs uh, funded by either USAID or the, the EU. And so my experiences and my information is actually based on what uh, I did and what I had as, as, as an experience with, with beneficiaries. So basically, yes, uh, this is, uh, well, the role of, of donors or donor programs 
uh, is uh, absolutely uh, enormous uh, in, in WTO accession because uh, WTO accession is uh, fairly complicated, complex, and very technical. And uh, all donors' uh, projects uh, that I worked on and the others that I knew about actually provided this necessary technical expertise uh, to acceding countries and their negotiating teams basically to, to make them kind of clear picture of what exactly it is. Because in my experience, most people don't have a clue what the accession process is, what uh, uh, is the subject of negotiations, how all these things go, what are the tracks of negotiations. So uh, it's, it's really, you start more or less uh, working with, with our beneficiaries from the blank uh, uh, sheet of paper and you, you start building, building on that. And with, with all that, uh, actually, there are a lot of prejudices, a lot of misinformation you have really to, to clear up the scene for, uh, for the work. So, uh, and uh, again, it's not, it's not that we are doing the work for the, for the beneficiary or for the exceeding country but rather uh, providing information and guiding them through the process, whereas they are making necessary, necessary decisions. But um, I think that without, uh, without the, the assistance provided by, by donors, it would be much more, much more difficult because most, most of the things that you, the exceeding country does uh, in the accession process is not, you cannot find this information uh, in textbooks and manuals. Each and every accession process is different. Each subsequent process is uh, more complicated than the previous one. You have uh, uh, more requests or different requests uh, as as the, the, the WTO uh, uh, evolves or the, the global situation uh, evolves, so it's uh, it's always different, and it's always good uh, to have someone who really understands the the situation and knows what's what's coming next. So uh, to cut the long story short, uh, I think that. Uh, our engagement, uh, our programs really make uh, uh, the process easier for the exceeding country. And at the same time, it actually provides uh, for the negotiating team of the exceeding country an excellent opportunity for learning uh, all the subtleties of, of WTO process and WTO law. So, uh, I would say that uh, there is nothing I don't I cannot find or think about anything else that could be that could replace the, the technical assistance uh, provided by by donors. And then, of course, there is the the, the other side of that picture. Uh, beneficiaries should actually accept. Uh, that assistance uh, in, a, in a good faith because it is provided in a good faith and actually use the, uh, every opportunity to, to actually do better in, uh, in the negotiation process because the, they own the process anyway and they, they are in charge. So uh, again, they could achieve uh, better results uh, a bit easier with the, with the assistance. Thanks, Jovan. Um, Josephine, are you with us? Yes. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. <laughs> right. You're at DFID in London, right? Or yes, I am. Yes. Um, so what is your take on this, um, on this aspect? Where can uh, development partners um, 
and, and Jovan also re referenced to the fact that development partners, there's different types of development partners, right? The donors, the implementing agencies, international organizations, bilateral, regional. Um, but where, where, what can they bring to the accession process and maybe even before and beyond the process? Mm -hmm. So thanks and thank you for inviting me. Apologies for my slightly late uh, joining. I'm having some technical issues, so if I suddenly disappear, I apologise in advance. But um, thanks for inviting me today. Um, as Jovan said, it's a really interesting discussion to have. I'm keen to hear from others, including the participants, for their thoughts on how development partners can support the accession process. I'm here representing the UK government. I work in Trade for Development team at the UK Department of Fresh National Development. I think you've already given me a nice introduction already. Um, we do implement quite a range of aid for trade programmes, um, some of which include support for WTO accessions. So um, before I share my thoughts, I just quickly reflect on what Jovan has um, said. I completely agree that um, the accession process is technical, it can be complicated, and that donors play a really important role. Um, but I just, you know, I think he would acknowledge this too. I don't think we're the ones that make it successful. I think the success is really in the hands of the exceeding country. So we're there to kind of support and um, provide the advice needed but really it's the countries themselves that kind of make it work. Um, the UK is a very strong supporter of accessions work at WTO um, at a time when I think we all acknowledge it's hard to find common ground on trade issues, especially when it comes to developing countries. Accessions is one of the few areas that pretty much everyone agrees it's, it's a good thing. Um, and we see it as a useful reminder that joining a global rules-based system can kickstart and kind of lock in reform in the exceeding countries. So in that context, I think the development partners can bring at least three things to the table um, when we're supporting exceeding governments. First of all, and I think the thing that people associate with development partners is that we bring our aid resources. Um, so, for example, the UK funds the Trade and Investment Advocacy Fund, which provides te technical advice to countries who are engaging in ongoing trade negotiations. So, and those negotiations include WTO uh, accessions process um, and funds like the Trade and Investment Advocacy Fund, which we call TAF2 Bus, which is a terrible name, but that is the um, the acronym that we all we all tend to use. And um, so funds like that can help exceeding governments better understand what they want out of the accessions process. We have um, some elements of logistical support helping to bring officials to Geneva to engage in the, the discussions and negotiations. And um, we are trying to help them land a final accessions package that really fits their development objectives. So, you know, that's one example of the resources that we can bring to bear. Obviously, DFID has much wider um, kind of development packages than just um, on accessions. And I think they all can contribute um, their own role, but um, that's one of the ones that is much more directly focused. Um, secondly, and um, these are kind of the areas I think are not, are not um, spoken about as much, which is we can bring out diplomatic support at the WTO. We recognize that exceeding missions by definition, they rarely have a large trade related footprint in Geneva. Um, you know, often the, the people who are permanent representatives are also managing a whole host of other um, priorities. Um, and donor partners can help exceeding governments reach out to other WTO members, help maintain momentum for the process, which is actually really hard to do from capital. So um, that's something that we can support with. Um, so where the the chair of many LDC successions sometimes organise events in Geneva. They highlight the progress that have been made or they reach out bilaterally to um, major members that might have a market access interest into that in that accession. And they can help play that bridging role um, as well in the process. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that we can use the same joined up approach that our exceeding governments use. So the beauty of an accession process is that it is a rare opportunity for all the trade related stakeholders to sit down together, sometimes for the first time, uh, to understand the aims and objectives of WTO membership and donor partners can and should do the same. 
So that's why in the UK, um, the Department for International Development, the Foreign, uh, Foreign Office and DIT, D D Department of Trade colleagues in London, we all work closely together to shape our engagement in this area. So as development partners, we can bring value by making sure that development considerations are part of the equation. So we're, we have a voice um, in that um, process. And that is a key part of what DIFFA's role historically has been. So um, we think this type of joined up approach can help finalise a deal that supports growth and development in LDCs. So those are my thoughts on kind of the three areas that development partners um, can bring. I'm happy to answer any questions on any of those. Thanks, Pamka. Thank you. Thank you, Josephine. Um, it seems, unfortunately, that our colleague Mela Kudesta is not able to join our session, so we won't have his perspective from Ethiopia, but we have um, almost 50 participants, so um, I'm pretty sure that also um, with engagement of our audience, um, uh, we can perhaps uh, uh, reach out a bit more to, um, to them instead. Uh, so we, we stimulate questions in the Q&A and then we will, uh, with the time that we have uh, a little bit more now, that we can engage the audience. Um, perhaps before we move on to the next question, I think this is interesting to, to just uh, stand still a moment with a, um, um, to ask ourselves the question, when is WTO accession successful? Because, um, uh, yeah, Jovan, you already mentioned that very often as, a, as an expert, uh, you, you actually start working with the government and, and, and stakeholders on a blank page, that there's very often um, really the need to, to almost, uh, uh, well, to start with basics on trade policy and uh, um, explain the process as such. Um, and Josephine, you, you also highlight the fact that it, it's, it's important to, um, to discuss what, what does the government want to achieve with, um, with its bid for, for WTO membership. Um, so, yeah, how do, you, how do you see that? When is an accession process uh, from, from the side of, a, of, an, yeah, of your ex, as an expert and, and from your side, Josephine, as a implement or donor, donor agency successful? Is it client satisfaction? And who is then the client? It's, it's, it's not as easy indeed. Is it the Ministry of Commerce that is in a negotiating seat or do you see that uh, increasingly broader where, um, yeah, private sector, parliament, uh, there are also uh, stakeholders that have a say and perhaps uh, a level of satisfaction. So have you got any thoughts on this? We can also park this question if you, if you think later on. I'm happy to come in with some thoughts, but um, I'm sure Jovan has some, you know, from his time working on the ground also has his own views. Um, I think for us, there's kind of two ways I try to look at it. First of all, um, the UK government support that we provide for accessions, and I was, I'll probably talk about this a bit more, is we um, usually, well, we in as many cases as possible, we make everything demand driven and we try to respond to the needs of the government. And the way that we try to, to make sure that those needs are being met is that we try to ensure that the advice is, that is given is independent expert advice that is separate from the UK's own kind of uh, views and agenda. And we set up our support in such a way that there is a third kind of it's through a third party and it's not influenced kind of by the UK um, in that way and we see that as important because we think it's important that that process is um, achieving the goals of the of the exceeding country and their own objective so I would see that you know successful support being that which kind of responds to those um, their own um, agenda and then um, the other way that I see it successful is kind of ensuring that you're bringing everybody along domestically in the exceeding country to make sure that you know the different stakeholders and the different organizations that um are affected by a wto accession are you know maybe they're not happy maybe they're not ecstatic but everybody's kind of had a, had an opportunity to feed in and there has been a 
an overall agreement yes we think this is the best thing to do and this is the this is the package that we think works for us and we're happy to move forward with it and i think there are examples where that has not been the case and that perhaps people have not understood or not been involved or kind of um sensitized as much as they should have been and that's really set things back and so for me that is not what success looks like and i think it's something that is um you know uh, it's probably the best of the best uh Kind of compromise available for all the different kind of stakeholders involved uh, on the domestic level interesting thank you joe fan would you like to add anything here yeah. yes yes i'm always ready to add something well i fully agree with, with what josephine said and basically what we do is a neutral neutral assistance uh so uh, we are trying really to do uh the best job we can uh regardless of whatever may be in the interests of the governments in the big political scene. Uh, so, uh, and then again, from my perspective, working uh, in the field, uh, well, I have noticed that basically we all tend to, to do the things quickly. So the sooner the better, but the speed is not always the good thing because it's, uh, it's really important that the beneficiary country or agencies or trade ministry or whoever is leading that effort that, that they really understand what they are doing. And so the accession process at the same time is the learning process for the, uh, for the exceeding country. And it's, it's very nice uh, these days, well, I'm long in time in this business, uh, I know uh, a, a person who, when I started 20 years ago to, to do this work, was a young apprentice in the Ministry of Foreign Trade. And these days she is chief negotiator. So you see the process of learning and expanding. That's, uh, that's one thing. Secondly, uh, uh, by uh, actually fulfilling uh, the requirements of WTO agreements and uh, uh, negotiating on, on a multilateral level with, with partners. Uh, actually, the exceeding country brings uh, its internal system in some sort of a good order. And even if it never accedes to WTO, the order is there. So the result is, some result is there. And uh, thirdly, and I, I, I find this uh, uh, very important, uh, the accession is not the goal by itself. Oh, we go there, we became members, we've done it and forget, uh, forget about it. No, uh, actually the, the work really starts after the accession because that's the moment when the uh, recently acceded country is about to start using the system to its benefit. Uh, and uh, for me, the uh, successful uh, accession is the one where the work actually continues without uh, any interruption on some sort of a post-accession activities uh, of implementation. Uh, of those newly adopted roles or uh, fulfilling uh, commitments and things like this. And I had a very good uh, experience with, with a country where immediately after, after accession, the government adopted a post-accession action plan, where basically, basically they listed the things that, that have to be done and uh, uh, it was adopted in the format of the uh, governmental decree became uh, mandatory for all, all uh, uh, players in the field, all ministries and agencies, and it worked well. So uh, the bottom line, the uh, successful accession is where basically the country becomes the member, starts using the system to its benefit and continues the work immediately after accession uh, to further improve uh, their trade regime and all related uh, systems. Yeah, thank you, Jovan. 
Um, that it's, it's indeed, I, I, I find this interesting that you also add uh, post accession because domestic reforms are, are so uh, sweeping um, and, and, and deep sometimes. Um, if, if the government is, is actually interested, interested in, in, in using the accession process as a, as a, also as a vehicle for, for improving uh, the domestic business environment. And um, uh, indeed, as you, as you mentioned, and then June 15 as well, uh, the length of an accession process um, has also much, uh, much to do with the complexity of the reforms. And a, one of the participants is asking, what is the length of, of an accession process? But I think we've seen really different models, right? We've seen, for example, um, I just looked at like Kazakhstan um, um, put down its bid in 1996, then had around 20 working party um, meetings and um, had a 10 year pause and then um, in 2015 um, acceded uh, to the WTO. Um, Afghanistan had a, of, of course a, a really unique situation. They put down their bid in 2003 and had um, a 10 year um, uh, had left activity over a number of years but then in 2011 had a working party and only had five working parties before joining um, the, the WTO. Uh, the number of working parties is also interesting to look at because it, it is quite a, a reflection of the, the, the number of questions and issues that are pending uh, from the perspective of, of WTO members. Um, so this is, this is pretty much deciding on the length uh, because in the end um, almost um, uh, uh, full 100% uh, approval from all the WTO members is needed to uh, to uh, allow a new member to the system, right? Uh, if if you allow me to to, to add something to it, uh, yes. But I think that the key element is the political will of the government to accede to WTO, uh, because if there is a clear political will then uh, basically uh, everything else is more or less technical. But sometimes uh, you have uh, these ideas, I've heard that a million times. Uh, we are not ready to exceed yet. We have to prepare and then when we are ready, we will exceed. That would be one option. Uh, second, second option starts with the question, what we are going to get from the WTO. And then when my answer to that question is, you are not getting anything, but except the set of tools to, to work further, uh, it's usually not accepted very good. But uh, the, really it, it, comes, uh, it comes to the intention uh, of the government, because if you start from the memorandum, for example, and you put all the comprehensive information in the memorandum. If you uh, don't try to kind of be silent of something that you know that, that is a problem, you just put a honest, full information. You uh, accompany uh, that with translations of all relevant, relevant laws and like regulations. You have a full picture, and then the, the, the members of the working party know what they are dealing with. Mm -hmm. If you don't provide the full picture, if you withhold some information for whatever reason, then you will have, you will have questions uh, uh, from WTO members, and that would be endless. Uh, because uh, really, uh, the only thing that WTO members or working party members want uh, is to know really uh, the to have the information and as long as they don't get it they will have questions so uh, uh that's 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 really really very important uh that uh the government really wants that and then uh i had uh experience with different governments where basically there was a situation where uh, there, there there was a need to to change a law for something, for whatever. And then it took us basically less than a week to do everything to, uh, for a draft to be approved by the government, uh, that uh, to be ratified by the parliament. And, and in a week we had 
uh, a change which was needed. On the other hand, you will, you will have a situation where uh, the exceeding country would say, oh, it's complicated, we cannot do that. Uh, the, the parliamentary procedure is long and complicated and so uh, you, you lose time. Uh, so it, that's, why, that's why it is, it is uh, uh, basically hard to tell how, uh, uh, how long it will last, but uh, I, 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 I will proudly mention the, the experience of, of Tajikistan, for example, uh, where uh, they also had this long time uh, the uh, uh, negotiations and uh, it dragged uh, to nowhere. And then it was decided, yes, we are going there. And then the whole process, more or less, the remaining process was done from March to December 2012. In, uh, uh, in nine months, I think something like 30 something laws and regulations were amended or changed. Uh, all the commitments were taken, uh, practices were changed, everything was done. And uh, basically in those, in those uh, nine months, we basically had something like four working party meetings because uh, it's not, it's, uh, the, the working party meeting again uh, is not purpose uh, uh, for itself. You have a working party meeting when, uh, when you have enough information to provide to, to WTO members. So basically it could last years, but I think that uh, realistically it cannot uh, last less than two or three years. It's not uh, physically, it's, it's not feasible. Yeah, by, uh, by changing um, laws uh, and, and accepting um, the requests in, in, in bilateral discussions, you can uh, probably speed up the process, but the question is indeed, um, are, there, are there meaningful outcomes that, that actually uh, support um, a, a change uh, in, in, in business environment attractiveness, in, uh, in also um, assuring the capacity to, to use the WTO system yeah. to the benefit um, and not only within the Ministry of Commerce, but perhaps also amongst the private sector. Um, so perhaps um, I, I think this is uh, very interesting uh, as, a, as a, that means of introduction. Um, could we now look at how um, implementing agencies such as DFID uh, or USAID, or how, what are your experiences in, in um, well, well, uh, allocating resources and, and prioritizing um, there are different uh, phases in the, in the accession process, uh, well, before, during and after. There are an, really a lot of different actors involved at, at country level. Um, uh, not only the Ministry of Commerce, there's most often the environment seats, but also different line ministries. Um, there's uh, the Geneva versus the capital um, and, and, the cap uh, and the private sector and, and other players at home. Um, how, how, Josephine, within DFID, um, how have you seen uh, perhaps also a development because you've worked for the last 10 years and I personally have seen a change in that sense um, and how, how funding resources are allocated. Thank you. Yeah, so um, when we're talking about kind of allocating resources and prioritizing and um, those kinds of things, as I was saying earlier, I think it, it, across um, Department for International Development in the UK, we try and do that on a needs basis um, and we prioritise in terms of responding to demand and identified needs. So that's across all the development programmes, not just in the area of trade or in the area of accessions in particular. So our approach is always demand led and uh, we design our programmes with that in mind. Um, but looking at for, like support for trade negotiations and accessions, it's also the case there. Um, as in my previous response, our current kind of flagship um, fund supporting accessions is the demand-led um, programme. And in that programme, we would usually be approached by an exceeding government. And that can be at any stage in the process. So, um, it, you know, the, the programme itself has quite a lot of latitude to kind of support negotiations, like to prepare to engage um, and then, you know, directly after the conclusion. So um, 
there is no kind of prioritization in that way. Um, so they're approached by the partner and then they prepare a mission to better understand what the needs of the potential beneficiary are and how the UK might be able to help. And we, ha we um, the fund employs technical experts um, to work, which I think actually, Franco, you were one of those um, at some point in the past to um, understand the priorities and objectives of the partner government and then work with them to design what the support looks like. So that's the kind of process at the moment in terms of how we identify who and where our resources go. But um, yeah, in, in that program, so an example, I guess, in that program is the support the UK provided to um, Afghanistan's accession. So the Afghanistan, the Afghan government had received support from other donors, including USAID, who had provided technical support and training to the Ministry of Commerce and Industry over the accession preparation period up to 2015. And then um, the TAF program came in to support during the end stages. So we provided funding to help complete um, some capacity building program as well as the WTO accession at the same time. And, um, you know, feedback is that that had a significant impact in preparing the government to meet the final requirements for accession. So, and that includes attendance at the first ministerial meeting and other things such as like a well-designed trade, like national trade policy. So I think that is an example of how, um, you know, the kinds of conditions that, that our current support could be effective. So it has a strongly committed government that was determined to follow the accession process through, which I completely um, agree with the earlier comments that that is the absolute kind of integral part of successful process. And TAF was able to come in and provide like a last mile support, which built on the previous contributions of other donors throughout that kind of much more extended process. So we were able to come in where there was a clear gap and help the accession process kind of over the finishing line. So whilst we can't attribute that outcome solely to what we were doing, it was a product of government and previous donors efforts. So it gives a kind of example of the types of conditions that we look for when we are trying to prioritise um, support for countries. Um, other ways that we kind of make sure we coordinate with other donors is in Geneva and in the capitals of the exceeding government and the WTO Secretariat itself often hosts very useful roundtables of development partners um, when exceeding government delegations are in Geneva so that gives an opportunity to um, for bilateral donors like the UK and agencies working in the space, WTO, UNCTAD, the bank, to better understand kind of where we might fit together um, and how we can best assist. Um, because I think for us, it's more like we don't do everything for everybody. The UK in particular, um, we tend to focus on deliverables that are kind of a result of specific um, expertise um international and national expertise so looking at tariff impacts or running stakeholder workshops but other partners and other agencies might have better might be better place to do something more systemic um like an economic a larger economic reform program that might be a precursor to the process so it, obviously everyone has a part to play but i think it's important that the exceeding governments needs are at the center and then the development partners kind of fit together their own skills and expertise to try and um, kind of respond to those needs. So um, those are a bit of my thoughts on um, kind of like working with other development partners, prioritising resources. Um, I think um, it's a very, you know, it can be a very long process. So I think it's about staying the course and kind of identifying um, or recognising that it's it's not a quick win in many cases, it's often kind of having to be in for the long haul and coordinating with others on what that might look like in terms of support. Yeah. Um, I'll stop thanks. there. But, um, yeah, I, I, one, one question before moving on to next, I think uh, for both of you, I, I personally um, work also in here in Brussels with the, the EU trade policy making process. And one of the good um, developments I've seen is actually the use of impact assessments before uh, the Commission goes into trade negotiations and stakeholder consultations uh, prior to setting priorities. Um, this is something that's always struck me working on W2 accession that um, a lot of times the, the, the accession process is started with indeed a strong political will, um, uh, but there's not such a a sort of a general impact assessment that uh, WTO exceeding governments um, have commissioned from independent experts, for example, to actually look at, look, where are we standing now? 
um, and then the memorandum provides indeed a sort of status quo um, snapshots of the trade regime. But also, what implications could WTO accession have and how could we use it um, for our, well, as a tool for long-term um, human development, uh, uh, human social and economic developments uh, in line with the long-term strategy? I mean, every country nowadays has 10-year long strategies. Um, have, you, have you come across that? I mean, is there a trend that, 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 that you see amongst developing countries or exceeding governments to also have a sort of, yeah, zero, um, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of impact assessments before actually um, setting priorities and as a guide to set priorities and work with donors. Uh, if I may, uh, well, again, as a worker in the field, uh, the problem with all these assessments is that there are too many variables. And uh, actually the, the final outcome of the, the accession really depends, depends on the, exceed, the, the government of the, of the exceeding country. Theoretically, the country can accede to WTO, become a member and does nothing afterwards. And there will be no impact whatsoever, almost. Or they could use the membership uh, 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 as a tool and uh, continue reforms, continue to improve whatever in, in, in their system. And, and uh, it is, again, I'm not uh, economist, I am not statistician, I cannot predict, uh, I don't have a crystal ball for that matter. Uh, I cannot predict uh, uh, the future, but it really depends on the behavior or the plans of the government. If they want to do something with it, they will do it. If not, mm -hmm. uh, there will be uh, kind of no, no, visible, no visible results. And you can, you can see afterwards that there are countries uh, where uh, you see the numbers, uh, really good numbers after the accession. And some other countries which uh, became members and nothing changed, even a few things went, uh, went down. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's really difficult, difficult to predict. And that's why- Yeah, there are uh, no models around to, to yeah, assess- Yeah, uh, to and, and then- uh, uh, Trade-related trade uh, impact assessments. Governments, governments uh, sometimes really insist to have this impact analysis, mm. uh, but, uh, again, uh, you cannot, well, whoever is, is doing that, it's in many levels, it's theoretical. We all know what can happen if everything is played right. Well, and it can also be sensitive and perhaps we don't always want to um, perhaps also um, Put on paper that that there can be um, uh, advantages, but there can also be be changes in in um, and job allocation and uh, yes. and um, economic uh, sectors that may win or lose as a result of, of uh, changing uh, market access. It's very quite yes, that's, that's, that's true. goods, right? Josephine, do you have something to add here, or shall we move on to I'm, the next question? I was kind of reflecting on whether I think there's been a trend in terms of is this something that's become more kind of a uh, tool and more popular, uh, the sort of the prior impact assessment. I think definitely in the cases of, um, you know, I've been because I've been working in the wider trade area for a while in terms of trade negotiations for FTAs, etc. That's definitely the case. I think there's definitely been an increase. And in, um, but I think I would probably agree that it depends on the government. I just I'm not sure I would say there's a particular kind of <coughs> rash or kind of um, rush to do that kind of impact assessment with all of the requests that we receive for um, support. I would say it's definitely kind of um, it's there for the ones that. Uh, that are keen to 
um, have a more evidence-based approach in terms of determining priorities. But uh, yeah, it, that, it, that depends on the government. I think, uh, yeah, I agree. I have an interesting commitment or comment from, uh, from, uh, from a participant from um, or Tia Hanna. She, she mentions that the Bahamas had two impact assessments commissions, one by the government and one commissioned by the Chamber of Commerce. So that's interesting that indeed there's a, it also reflects that perhaps uh, there was a need to have um, two separate um, or uh, to have different impact assessment commission. So uh, that's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> right, then there's another participant and this question that we had also lined up um, asking about uh, what are the challenges that we face um, that, or that you have faced in, as an implementer for carrying out technical assistance and um, I think, uh, well, perhaps Jovan, could you could you uh, summarize? Because we're okay, we're uh, we have some time. But could you uh, summarize some of the key challenges that you see? Oh yes, I can. <laughs> I can. I can talk I about can. it <laughs> till the end of time. <laughs> but uh, I will try to to make it to make it short. Uh, actually, the first I think that the first challenge is that. Whenever you start something like that, you hear the phrase, we are going to negotiate and become members under our terms. Mm. And that's the first prejudice, which must be kind of cut in pieces. Uh, because many people really believe that they could negotiate something different or something better than many others be, uh, before them. And uh, that's uh, that's pretty uh, that, that complicates uh, complicates the work. And uh, also, uh, as we all know, there is uh, a part of WTO negotiations which which is not negotiation at all uh, on a, a level of uh, compliance with WTO rules. You don't negotiate you simply have to, to accept uh, all the agreements, all their provisions, and, in, uh, and actually put them in your, in your uh, uh, legislation before the accession. So uh, wasting time negotiating something different uh, doesn't make any sense. And that's, that's a challenge uh, for many countries to understand that. Also, uh, uh, the challenge is to understand the uh, bilateral negotiations, the market access. Uh, it is, well, each and every uh, WTO member, in particular those who basically participate in, in all uh, accession negotiations on a bilateral level, they have their, their own interests which they defend. And these interests are, are, are known. You will, you will know, for example, that Canada will always include somewhere a, a, a special, special regime for canola oil, for example. Uh, and there's nothing you can do about it. But then again, in many countries, people don't have a clue what canola is. And there is no import of canola oil. And there is no impact of, of low Im or, or zero import duty on canola oil. And these are things that have to be explained and understood by, by our uh, beneficiaries. And basically this uh, whole idea that the negotiation must focus on the things that are negotiable, that's first and foremost. And secondly, uh, where basically they could really defend their case because uh, many countries would say, oh, uh, Agriculture is important for us. We have to protect our agriculture. If you look at the tariff nomenclature, there are probably 5,000 tariff lines uh, of agricultural products. And no one will accept this. Oh, agriculture is important for us. But if you negotiate something like, I don't know, 100 tariff lines, which are important for them, uh, it's negotiable. Uh, and so these are these are the challenges. Uh, there is also the idea when you when you work on a, on a, a level of uh, legislation. Standard answer is oh, it's not possible. 
it's against our legal traditions. It cannot be done. Well, it can. Eventually, it is done. But it, uh, it, takes, uh, it takes quite some time uh, for, uh, for negotiating teams and the governments to understand that. And for that, it's, it's, it's really important for uh, a negotiating team to be really uh, people who are handpicked because they are good in something, not because uh, uh, they like uh, to travel to Geneva uh, for, for, for a nice excursion. Uh, a good negotiating team, which is built from the beginning and which will uh, be consistent, where over, over time uh, you will deal with same people. If each and every time for every working party meeting, you have a new people from different ministries and agencies, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not very, very successful. But again, uh, it takes time uh, for the beneficiaries to understand that. Uh, very rarely they would take the advice, just don't do it this way, it's, it's wrong. Uh, they have to, to understand why it is wrong and then uh, move, move forward. But it is, it is exactly, in many instances, the changes that have to be made in the country are pretty much fundamental. Really, uh, these things that we uh, recommend to be changed or WTO members require to be change, changed, uh, that's something that never happened before. They didn't have provisions like this. They didn't have laws like this. Uh, the best possible example is uh, protection of intellectual property rights. In many countries, uh, market is 95% pirated and counterfeit. And people don't, have, don't actually think about the concept that that's right, that intellectual property is a property at all, and then it belongs to someone. Uh, so uh, these are the things that require a lot of time. Uh, and I've seen that uh, many times when, when I started uh, working in a new country, uh, but uh, eventually it happens. Eventually it happens. It, it starts, for example, with those customs measures uh, uh, regarding intellectual property rights, where customs officers have this ex officio uh, uh, powers to actually confiscate uh, pirated goods or counterfeit goods. And then the first reaction on each and every customs administration is, no, we are not going to do that. It's not our job. We are not going to make more money for Microsoft. They have enough money already. And then after, after years, they actually do it. And they have a special section which deals with that. And then they participate in, in conferences and, uh, uh, where they present their results and how many uh, uh, products uh, they were confiscated, how many destroyed, what's the value, and so on and so forth. So uh, these, are, these are the difficulties. Uh, but then again, it's, it's, a, it's a, learning, a learning process. You cannot simply inject, put it that way, all this at once and just change everything. It's, I think it's it interesting time. that you, you mentioned intellectual property. Um, it, it, indeed, it's one of the big challenges for many exceeding governments. But it's also um, one of the areas, not, um, um, one of the areas where, <clears throat> well, most of, let's say, OECD countries have quite an offensive interest also that uh, IP systems are, are, are strengthened and also that the enforcement is actually um, uh, carried through. Um, so in that sense, this is also an aspect that we can maybe briefly touch upon that, that there is also this sensitive role uh, where the donors are very often countries that actually are also having a, um, an economic interest in, in the improvement of, 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 a, of a domestic uh, legal environment and not only market access but also uh, indeed for, for protection of their own um, patents for example and oh. uh, developing countries on the other hand 
may have an interest in in uh, in really um, uh, yeah maybe having mi more minimum standards of, of intellectual property protection or or, or sequencing um, to a certain extent. So uh, yes, you're 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 right. Uh, of course, it's it's complicated. It depends, like many things in life, depends uh, on your on your position uh, where uh, you are looking at this from. But uh, it has to be, first of all, it's always a process. Uh, secondly, this is the request of WTO members. So it's, uh, uh, the, the, the accession is uh, basically driven by requests of, uh, of the working party members. So this is the request, whether we philosophically agree with many of these things or not, this is the request. But there is uh, also an important uh, element to it. It's not uh, the system that will protect just foreign right owners uh, in a particular country or territory. By establishing a system of protection of intellectual property rights, you actually boost your own creative industries uh, to, to actually work and uh, uh, have a mechanism to protect the results of their intellectual work. So it is, it is complicated. It is on, on, on both practical and philosophical uh, level, but it's always a process. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, basically... Maybe, maybe uh, to intervene um, there on... on um, I've, I've been once part of a, of an, of, of a training, of a workshop on, on competition law and competition related reforms, also uh, government procurement in, um, in Belarus, and it was around 10 years ago. And this is an interesting, um, just I'm bringing this in because um, there was quite clear that, that, that there was an interest from um, well, WTO members to, to well, pretty much improve and set up a competition, um, uh, competition law and, and open, it, open up procurement, government procurement. Uh, but at the time it was completely, it, it was absolutely an area that was really sensitive, even for domestic, you know, even for universities, it was really hard to, to speak out on, on the need for, um, yeah, a competition law, for uh, competition related policies. And I, for me, that would be actually an example of what doesn't work and where perhaps the, 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 the donor went a little bit beyond its, well, uh, it's not a mandate, it but- It works, it, it works all the time. Yeah, do you impose or do you go with the speed and interest of the country? No, but, uh, donors, I wouldn't say the donors impose, at least it's not the way how I worked or, or our projects worked. You cannot impose. Uh, first of all, that's, uh, that's not the way to, to a successful project. It's not the way for successful support. Uh, but uh, it is, it is it's kind of naturally developed process. 10 years ago, government procurement, as you mentioned, was something that was almost not acceptable in that. These days, it is acceptable. Yeah. Uh, not, not always I, enthusiastically. I think we cannot go into f so much detail yeah. on government procurement, unfortunately, Jovan, because yeah. we have still a, a second half of the session also, and we're, we're quite running out of time. Um, uh, but indeed, uh, it's interesting to hear some of the challenges and, and personally, uh, one of the challenges I found uh, in, in supporting exceeding governments is also to have a meaningful uh, dialogue with different stakeholders where the government is aware of, of where the local private sector and, and other players um, have maybe offensive and defensive interests. It's not always clear. I've, I've really run into a situation where government is actually not aware of where the domestic players uh, um, want them to be more offensive and, and less defensive, and also as a result of non-existing dialogue locally on trade. Um, obviously, now with the trade facilitation agreement, you see that this has been become much more common that there's national dialogues on trade facilitation. And, and um, but uh, yeah, that's personally one of the challenges that I found. To add here, maybe the audience see also um, some specific challenges, but um, uh, I think we will move on to um, a follow-up uh, question. 
So maybe to look at LDCs um, as a specific uh, group of countries um, that may uh, require a specific uh, or, or a different uh, type of assistance, um, or maybe not. I mean, uh, where do you see uh, where do you see the, the importance of, of LDC um, uh, LDC accession support? Maybe Josephine, do you have some ideas that you could share with us? us? Sure. So um, I think the questions that we were shared with us was that whether relevant partners have done enough for LDC accessions and what can be improved. Um, and from our perspective, I mean, I won't repeat all the stuff about kind of development partners being only one part of the story. I think that's been made very clear. But I think there are a couple of areas where we can probably do a bit of a better job. Um, the first is helping governments tell their story domestically, as I was kind of talking about a bit about earlier, talking to parliamentarians and the wider public about why the WTO matters and the kind of clearing up those misconceptions that affect public support for the process. And having worked in the Pacific region, I, I learned quite a lot from the long struggle of Vanuatu's succession process um, and the importance of dialogue, like not just between Kind of government and civil society and business and sort of local stakeholders but also between Geneva and capital and kind of making sure that that, that information is flowing. I think you know the accessions process is a, a, a sort of opportunity for genuine debate about what that means and what that benefits are and so rather than just focusing on sensitizing like the, the, the sort of lawmakers, the parliamentarians, mm. the government, it's really important to um, to help get that message out, and I think that there's something that we, you know, as a relevant partners, can encourage and do in that area. And um, I mean, obviously, Vanuatu's accession highlighted some problems with the process. It was a catalyst for sort of change and the special treatment of LDCs to become more of like the norm. Um, but despite kind of um, efforts to streamline the process um it's not been as successful in all cases as we would have hoped and it's still a, a quite a long journey so the other area that i think that we can do a bit of a better job is that um you know i talked to our our director of the our taf program about this is that we we can have a clearer idea that that development partners need to be in for the long haul if we are kind of serious about supporting LDCs to exceed and I know that there are varying kind of lengths of time but I don't think it's ever a short you know it's never a very short process and given the constraints of the planning horizons that we have internally it's very unlikely that one partner is able to support an entire process from start to finish you know we often plan, plan programs with a four or five year timeline and often that wouldn't be sufficient so I think it's a case of us working with the with the government with our you know organizations international organizations and part and other development partners to kind of pass the baton between us in terms of support so that the country can um, complete the accession process and undertake kind of capacity building and reforms along the way and the and can kind of play a role in ensuring continuity by briefing incoming new kind of development partners on their latest needs, their kind of most recent needs and pointing them to where their local kind of expertise is. Um, the benefit, I guess, of the accessions process is that there is sort of, that it's clear and it's possible to work along a kind of milestone basis. So I think um, the other area like development partners can work on is kind of not seeing accessions as like a success or failure if if it concludes or not but kind of maybe measuring success more in, in terms of progress of reaching those um, particular milestones so yeah i mean basically being a bit more transparent and realistic about how long accession takes the multiple phases of support that are likely to be needed and then kind of shaping goals in a way that supports like that longer process um and um yeah, so those are kind of some thoughts. I think we also need to keep supporting the LDC representation in Geneva. I kind of alluded to that earlier. There's, you know, we understand that there are huge kind of um, pressures on very few people often in, and that it's important that we um, make sure that they're able to engage in it kind of effectively, not just working with capitals. But um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Jovan. Oh. Yeah, Jovan? Uh, uh, 
I, I could only uh, fully agree uh, uh, with what Josephine just said. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I'm working in the field, not exactly in an organization that creates programs uh, uh, for, for assistance, but on a, on a working level, when you are working in the fields, uh, in the field, uh, uh, there is not much, much difference. You basically do the same thing. Uh, sometimes in LDCs, it could be more complicated, take more time, but it is basically the same kind of work. But I would just uh, like to, to point out something that Josephine said, and she mentioned, uh, you mentioned continuity. That's, that's an important thing because uh, all these processes take time. Each project has its own lifetime. And no matter how good uh, uh, the work was and results, it may happen that simply uh, project is finished, that's it. We all pack our stuff and off we go. And uh, probably another year, for example, could make a huge difference, but it's not extended or there is no new project. And whatever, is, whatever was done in, uh, in previous four years simply diminishes uh, mm. fairly, fairly quickly. And that's that. The problem of continuity uh, is 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 really important. I had uh, uh, experiences uh, both ways, where uh, there was no continuity, where there was a continuity, where basically uh, uh, another donor picked up uh, after after the one donor finished its its, its uh, project. Uh, the other donor basically picked up where uh, this project uh, ended and continued even with same people yeah, who, yeah. who worked on a previous project. So it's continuity is probably the, 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 the key word. Yeah, and maybe also engaging local um, people to actually make sure that the, the, the trade policy expertise in country, not only for WTO membership, but also for bilateral regional uh, trade negotiations and, and, and the follow-up, right? I mean, transparency, dialogue, um, that local experts are engaged. I mean, I've been part of a, well, I've worked on a West African, uh, in a West African country where, like, I remember one bilateral donor just put five, five European people to sit in a ministry for a couple of years and then they ran out again. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit blunt to say, but I mean, where, where is the sustainability then, right? I mean, obviously they, they transfer knowledge and, but um, yeah, I think that, that is really important to make sure that there's a... I think it is important and, and actually one of the outcomes of each and every donor's project should be basically that uh, that project leaves few people trained in, in, a, in, a, certain, in a certain field. Yeah. Without yes. that, it's uh, it's it's probably uh, not that good. That's right. The... I thought. I think we've like almost come to the end of our um, our contributions, and and uh, I would propose that we look at um, the audience. If we have any interesting questions here that we could um, um, look at, um, let's see. Well, the challenges. Well. Uh, We've already looked at that. What kind of... We've touched the most of the topics that are... Um, to what extent uh, donors should uh, be engaged and how long? Um, what, type of, what type of specific assistance as donors can, can provide? Well, I think we've, we've pretty much covered that, right? Before, during the accession negotiations and actually this, this need to not only look at the short-term gain of, of concluding the, the negotiations, but actually have a longer-term perspective to, um, to make sure that uh, the WTO membership is actually um, uh, used. Um, Perhaps the audience, are there any, uh, any people that would like to maybe share a comment or share an in insight here? And don't be shy. 
Uh, yes. I just something, sorry, Frank, come on. Oh, sorry, am I interrupting? No, go ahead. I, I just, um, you were talking a bit earlier about the challenges that development partners kind of face and the tension that there is between um, a donor who is funding, you know, assistance for an accession process, but then may also be on the other end, you know, and negotiating around market access, etc. And I think, like, I just wanted to sort of um, say that that is definitely something that development partners think about and I, I kind of refer back to my earlier comment which was around um, making sure that the, the voice of the development kind of lead organisation within government is a part of the discussion between you know internally so that you're at least consistent in terms of how you're engaging externally both with you know with the exceeding country um, and so it's kind of a process of coordination internally but then I think that it's complemented by what I think is kind of the approach that we prefer of when we do provide assistance technical assistance and advice we really do as much as we can to make it independent from us and sort of separate and provided through another kind of route and um, which I think you know it, it's it's absolutely imperative because otherwise you that advice is not trusted and the process you know it breaks down the process um itself so i just wanted to sort of acknowledge that yeah. there are that the challenges are there and we do think about them and kind of it's not really an easy answer but we just try and make sure we're all on the same page basically yeah i can imagine this maybe perhaps in in, in the in the situation where where the uk may actually negotiate um new trade agreements with bilateral partners it may actually be a topic that you would have to uh, look at more carefully unfortunately um, yeah, I, mean, my, I have another uh, aspect. Obviously, the trading system has evolved and, and, and um, WTO membership and the compliance requirements don't actually cover all the, 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 the trade issues that, um, and, and, and uh, trade interests that, uh, that exceeding governments have. So, uh, obviously, the WTO plus topics, uh, Singapore issues, but beyond that, I mean, e-commerce is a really important example. Um, where, if I, in my perspective, technical assistance for W two exceeding countries would necessarily, I mean, not necessarily, it's not required, but it, a topic like e commerce and and uh, data um, data related uh, uh, aspects uh, could also figure in an accession process. Um, but well, I don't know what, what the practices are on that at the moment. Um, but if if a, if an exceeding country is an observer and may also engage in e-commerce related negotiations, they would need also um, awareness and, and understanding in that area, right? Um, I think that's a really relevant point. I mean, sorry, I I don't want to. I just be I make a quick comment, which is that um, from our perspective. You know, when we provide support to exceeding countries, we don't limit it to say, oh, it's only on the, the issues you absolutely have to engage with. If there was a kind of a request or need for or kind of interest in also looking at e-commerce support, then that's um, that's still within our kind of um, remit. And I but I think it's a really important point that I don't feel like that that's the norm in that we sort of I'm not sure that we at the outset say, oh, look, this is exactly what was required, but this is what the whole remit of kind of what's going on at the WTO is. And therefore, we should think about it in a wider sense. I think it's it's that's not the instinct. So, it, yeah, it's a really interesting point. I mean, that's only from our perspective. Yeah, yeah if I if I may just add uh, each W2 accession process is different. There are no uh, two processes that are equal in uh, all aspects. Uh, the, the situation generally changes and then uh, it is reflected in the process and requirements uh, of, of the process. A uh, few years ago, uh, there was no uh, trade facilitation agreement. Uh, so uh, all, although uh, whatever is in the agreement was mentioned somewhere before, but not in that detail. Uh, now we have the new agreement. We have the new uh, uh, requirements based on that agreement. And inevitably, these things will become uh, a part of negotiations in the future. Uh, and uh, uh, the same thing with, uh, with e-commerce. 
in particular with this uh, COVID-19, apparently our new normal, whatever it may be in the future, will actually rely uh, on e-commerce uh, uh, much more than it used to it just three months ago. Yeah. So, and, and it will be reflected on the process. The yeah, country so, which so becomes reflects, member. Donors yeah. will probably uh, indeed uh, adjust also their, their uh, priorities in technical assistance. And there was one question from the audience actually, how will COVID-19 impact on, 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 on uh, technical assistance uh, and priorities for, for example, W2 accession or trade related um, programs? Well, I don't know uh, how they will do it and uh, what will be the impact in future. Uh, but so far we continue our work. Uh, most of that work is uh, remote at this point. We will have, uh, uh, in, in a week we will have the first working party meeting that will be held in a hybrid uh, mode, both uh, Zoom and uh, physical presence in the uh, in the hall in the, in the WTO headquarters. So uh, apparently, the practice is being adjusted to uh, to the situation, and I don't think that uh, actually the intentions or the practices. Uh, of donors will, will be changed because of that. The appearance of, of, of our assistance and the way how we do it probably will, but I don't think that uh, it will change much in essence. Mm. I would probably agree with that. I think that the modality changes, but the content probably not, not really that much in terms of you know, support for an ongoing negotiation or an accession process. But um, I would say that the thing, one of the things that, you know, the UK has um, advocated for is the, well, and I think which has become apparent is the importance of the notifications process and trying to um, support countries to make the notifications where they've implemented kind of trade related measures um, help that that helps other countries to understand kind of what's happening in terms of the impact of COVID-19 and help them kind of analyze that impact. So that's something the UK is supporting um, developing country to do, which is um, to make notifications. So I thought I'd mention that seeing as it's relevant. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I think we've, um, we've come to the end of this, this webinar. Um, there aren't really, uh, additional questions I think that we could uh, address here. Um, what we've covered here um, in the last one and a half hours really been interesting and personally thank, thanks a lot Jovan and Josephine for your perspectives. So we've, we've de definitely agreed on, on the complexity of the process and, and the, the added value of, of, of technical assistance. Um, it's a pity we did not have uh, Melaku's uh, perspective from Ethiopia, which is a country that has been really engaged in a really lengthy and, and very challenging and interesting process. Um, but uh, perhaps next year we will have that occasion if the Aztec session week will probably take place again. Um, so thanks a lot and thank you for our colleagues from the Secretariat. Um, I don't know whether the recordings will be shared or made available, but um, I think our colleagues uh, from the Secretariat will, uh, will definitely provide a, a follow-up message to those people that have registered to this session. So, yes, thank you all for the, for the, pres for the participation. And uh, tomorrow there's two more sessions on, uh, uh, as part of the accession week. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out to any of the experts in the session, Jovan, Josephine, or myself over LinkedIn. Probably you can find us. And we're happy to uh, to touch base there. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks very much. Bye. 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 Bye.